All right, you guys. So we're gonna go over a couple of the games that I did that I did play. Let me stop the music. Um, that I did play in this recent event here in St. Louis. Just do some light analysis. Um, as you guys know, I won the St. Louis Rapid and Blitz with nine wins, eighteen draws, zero losses. Uh, I think I finished about four points ahead of everybody else. Maybe maybe it was like three and a half. I, I don't know what the exact final standings were, but I won the event. In particular, there were two games that I think really sort sort of propelled me to victory, and they were the games against Lenny Dominguez and Fabiano Caruana on the third and final day of the rapid portion of the event. So I'm going to go over, um, I'm going to go over two of the, two of those, uh, or those two games specifically do some light analysis. Cause again, I was playing the event, didn't really have any, any, any time to recap during, during it. So we'll go over it now. All right. So to set up the scene, uh, going to the start of the third day of the event, I believe that I was, uh, I think two points out of first place. So I knew that there were 18 games of blitz ahead, but there were, with three rapid games and two white specifically, I knew that I needed to win win one or two to, to get on the board and really be very close to uh, uh, to have a chance to win, win the whole event. All right, so okay, so so without further ado, let's start. So in this game against Lenny, I played d4. He responded with pawn to d5. I played c4. He played pawn takes pawn. Uh, those of you, some of you may or may not be familiar with this opening. This is called the Queen's Gambit accepted. Where, um, where white basically pushes the pawn and move two and black takes. Of course, black can also play pawn to e6, and this is traditionally called the queen's gambit declined. So essentially on move two, black is a choice to accept the gambit or to decline it with pawn to e6, um, or pawn takes pawn. So the game pawn takes pawn is played. Knight to f3 is what I play. Knight f6 is played, e3, e6. Bishop takes c4, pawn to c5. And now I castled, and Lenny played knight to c6 here. Now this is a little bit of an unusual setup, not the, not perhaps the most uh, the most common setup. Normally Black will play pawn to a6 here, and then White has a plethora of options. White can take on c5 and play play an endgame like pawn takes pawn, queen takes queen, rook takes queen. This is one example. Um, White can also play things like b3, bishop b2, or even knight to c3 and queen e2. But there there are many different options. Um, so after castles, knight c6 is played. I play knight c3, Lenny goes a6. I played queen to e2 here. Now on first glance, one might think that that after pawn takes pawn, you're just gonna be behind by one pawn, because after pawn takes, knight takes, knight takes, queen takes, black is ahead by one pawn in the center here. He has one, two, three, four, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. White has one, two, one, two, three, four, five. Um, and so you're down a pawn. However, that being said, as you guys can see from the evaluation, white is actually much better here. Because after rook to d1, queen to c5, white gets a lot of quick development. You get the bishop into the game. You're going to have both rooks on open files. And black is still lacking. Hasn't developed the bishop on f8 or the rook, rook on um, or the rook on h8 here. So it's very difficult to play. So therefore, Lenny, Lenny, of course, being a very strong grandmaster and studying this opening very in-depth, he knew that he, he wasn't going to grab the pawn on d4. So instead he plays b5. Um, here I go bishop to b3, and Lenny plays bishop b7. And this is where I uncorked something of a novelty. I think it's been played maybe once or twice. Uh, and it's this move pawn to d5. Now this looks like a very, um, this looks like a very weird, th this looks like a very weird move because you figure, well, what, what is this pawn push doing? You're just down a pawn. What, what, what is this? Like black can take either with the pawn or with the knight, and black should be doing very, very well here. It's just, a, it's just a clean pawn that you're ahead. So, so what, what is Hikaru doing? Why is he blundering? blundering away a pawn with pawn d5 um but actually it's not a blunder and and lenny used a lot of time here on his next move because he was very unsure what to do uh and this is an example of where of two things that come into play the first thing is that is that you really um you you really try to surprise your opponents in the game and come up with something they've never seen before and and really at the board make them have to figure out what the best way is to play versus going home and preparing with the computer and being able to figure out figure it out uh, and not have to sort of work it through through your own or have to work it through um, or work through through it all at the board w with your own brain I should say. Um, I, I was walking around lounging after that one. Yeah, because the problem for Lenny is that d5 is a very strange move, and it's not apparent what you're supposed to play. Now, again, as everybody can tell, because we do have the lines on here, if, if you see from the lines, the computer just says pawn takes pawn, zeros, black is completely fine, easy, easy game, no worries. Um, now, sure enough, pawn takes pawn is completely fine. Both moves actually are okay for black, but after pawn takes pawn, uh, pawn to e4, it's very easy to get get 
concerned here is black because what do you do? If you take the pawn on e4, for example, I can go knight takes pawn and rook e1. And as you'll see from the valuation, white should be a little bit better. If you play something like pawn to d4, white can then go pawn to e5. And you figure knight d7, you just get crushed by pawn to e6. Um, and of course, if you take the knight, I just take, take this knight. Your king's in check. If you block, I take the bishop. If you move the king, I go rook to d1 bishop to d6 and now i can play bishop to f4 and it's just lights out the king is in the middle of the board everything is overloaded and black is completely lost here so basically in this position uh, after pawn takes pawn e4 the computer will tell you that d4 e5 and i believe uh knight to g4 and black is supposed to be completely fine here again if, if you have plenty of time at home to look at this with a computer program, it's very easy to figure out that this is this is completely fine. But over the board without knowing, it becomes very difficult. And secondarily, when you're playing a rapid game of chess where you only have 25 minutes for the whole game, you can think for 10 or 15 minutes. But if you do that and you don't come up with it with an accurate reply, you're going to be left with 5 to 10 minutes. And, um, and it's going to be very, very hard to play. So... So here, Lenny plays the the more human move, which is knight takes pawn, and now I played now I played rook to d1, and here Lenny again went for a deep think, and he played uh, he played a very strange move here. He played this queen b8 move, which objectively I think probably loses him the game. That being said, it's very difficult as a human without a computer to sort of without a computer to kind of help you along to figure to realize that in this position you can just very simply play this move bishop to e7. Now again. We're humans. We've played a lot of chess. We we've seen a lot of themes, a lot of patterns. And in Bishop E7 again, this is what and this is why computers are so so good at the game. Is computers don't care. Like as a human, when you see the rook on D1, you see the queen on D8, you're very afraid. You're worried about E4. You there might be even like a take takes takes and some kind of fossil with Knight F6 here, um, and you just get naturally very scared because in this position you see this and it's like. OMG, like your your queen is on the file. You have to move the queen off the file. Now, as I now as I as I would say, like for computers, the computer just laughs and, laughs in your face and goes bishop e7 because it very correctly sees it after pawn to e4. Black is a very nice move. Knight to d4. Knight takes knight, and black can now go knight takes knight on c3 in between. And after pawn takes knight, pawn takes knight. Um, we reach this position with c takes d4 castles, which is maybe slightly better for white, but it's not anything special. And the game continues. It's very simplified, and, and we, we just play play into the middle game. Um, but, but again, for, for a human over the board not knowing this, it's very, very hard to figure out. And that's why Lenny played a move that, that I kind of was wondering if he would do. He played queen to b8 here because, again, you got to get the queen out uh, off the off the d file because the rook is rook, there's going to be some kind of pin or something bad is going to happen. And so Lenny plays queen to, queen to b8. I play bishop takes knight. He takes my bishop, and now I take back with the knight. Lenny plays bishop to d6. And this is where uh, I found another very, very good move, which is I play this move knight to b6. Now, ordinarily, uh, are, are we are we still on are we still in theory? No, this is not theory. I think d5 would have been played one time in a high level game, but that's it. Um, why queen c7, not queen b8? Well, the reason that Lenny played queen b8 is because after queen c7, bishop takes knight, pawn takes. When I take with the knight, I'm, I'm I hit the queen, so he has to move the queen, so he loses a tempo of time. Whereas when he puts the queen on b8 here, you'll notice the queen's not under attack, and now he can move the bishop and try to get his king out of the center and castle it as fast as possible. So, so after bishop to d6, I play knight to b6 here. Lenny moves his rook to a7, and now I found the very nice move queen to d3. And basically, the, the problem here is that... Um, oh, also someone says, why not queen c8? Well, he didn't go to c8 for another reason. He didn't go to c8 after takes 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 i'm threatening now to fork the queen and the queen and the rook on b6 anyway so you're gonna have to waste time you still can't develop your bishop and castle your king out of the center of the board so that that's why um that's why that's why he played queen b8 so takes 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 knight b6 rook a7 i go queen d3 hitting the bishop on d6 now again if black had one more tempo or i didn't mean to do that sorry if black had um if black had one more tempo in this position uh say for example i go a3 and black and castle Black is uh black is completely fine. Maybe maybe even better in some ways. But the fact is that black doesn't have that time. So after queen d3, Lenny goes bishop to e7. Of course, in this position you can't really be meme. -y. You can't you can't do the meme and play a bond cloud with king e7. So you go king e7. Uh, there are many ways to win. Uh, I think queen e4 is probably the cleanest way. And if you go like king d8, there's going to be 
I guess knight g5 is one way. Queen f4 maybe is good. Probably knight g5 is simplest. And the knights are jumping. The queen is jumping. Your king is bad. Your queen is bad. Your rook is bad. All your pieces are really, really bad here. So it's basically just really, um, really close to lost. So instead, Lenny goes bishop to e7. And now I play queen to d7 check here. He goes king to f8. And I go queen to f5. Threatening, of course, to, to, to fork the king and the queen with knight to d7. So he plays king g8, sidestepping. And now I just play a very quiet move, b3. Now, very, very difficult to play like this. But I kind of realized at this point in the game that even though it looks like white is overwhelmingly better, black has no development. You see, like, the rook can't go anywhere um, on a7. The queen on b8 is not great. The king is awful. And the rook on h8 is also specifically stuck in a corner. So in this position, it looks really, really bad. But, but the thing is that... Um, that there is no knockout blow there's no way to just win the game on the spot or win material so you kind of have to dial it back and just try to try to find good solid moves and so here i played pawn to b3 with the idea of uh fianchitoing my bishop on b2 towards the long diagonal g7 and h8 specifically so h5 is played by lenier a very another very logical move here because what he wants to do is he wants to get his rook out he wants to lift the rook uh, because again in this position uh, it looks like lenny has basically forgotten how to castle because because normally when you castle the king goes from e8 to g8 and the rook jumps to f8 but the king is on g8 and the rook is stuck on h8 still so for that reason um lenny plays h5 very logical move and he tries to lift the rook so bishop b2 rook to h6 is played here uh now here i go rook a c1 again the idea behind rook a c1 primarily was to play knight d7 and put maximum pressure on this pawn on c5 and with the rook on c1 instead of a1 there's an additional pressure point pr uh, piece putting pressure on c5 so after rook c1 he goes queen e8 play knight to d5 uh bishop to f8 is played i play queen to g5 trying to go for some dirty tricks here first of all let's say black plays just a normal move like rook a8 uh it walks into a very nasty tactic where i go queen takes rook he goes pawn takes queen and now i go knight f6 forking the king and the queen again so here Lenny plays queen e6 uh, to protect the rook. I go knight f4, goes queen g4, and now I play this move h3. Now maybe this, this move isn't the absolute best move, but the problem for black is even here after queen takes knight takes, black has kind of developed this rook to h6, but at the same time this pawn on c5 is still extremely weak where I can go knight e4 and target it. Additionally, I do control the open d file more or less. And the last problem for black is that the bishops really have no targets. The, the bishop is maybe eyeing the pawn on g2, not really a target. The other bishop is just passive and it's guarding the pawn on c5. So all those factors sort of combine to give white a very big advantage here. And of course, to, to make matters even worse, you'll see the computer will say that it's like 0.7. It doesn't say it's completely lost, but to, but to make matters worse, Lenny, of course, had used a lot of time calculating which way to capture the pawn on d5. So he's already under five minutes at this point which only really compounds the problems that he had. So here he plays bishop to a8, again, trying to bring his other rook into the game potentially. Now here I play bishop a3. Again, maybe not the absolute best move, but the point is that after I go, is that I originally wanted to go knight to e4, but after knight e4, black has this very nasty move, knight to b4, uh, fossilizing the knight on e4 and the pawn on a2 at the same time. So it's a nice double attack um and if i take the pawn on c5 black takes and on rook c2 there's just knight before rook c1 knight a2 and i basically have to keep the rook on the c file forever because otherwise i will lose this knight on c5 so i, I was really worried about this idea and i kind of want to stop it so i decided here to go bishop a3 first and the reason i did this is that here black has a problem first of all black can't really push c4 because we trade and then i take and i'm just up one pawn if if black was knight before here uh, there probably are many ways to win, but probably trading going um, going rook d8 is probably just crushing. Or actually, not rook d8, sorry. Rook c8 is probably crushing because I'm going to get the double stack on the 8th rank, and I'm going to hit both of the bishops on a8 and f8, and black is just completely doomed. And so that's why black goes b4. So basically, black prevents me from capturing the pawn, and now I have to waste a move going back with my bishop. However, even though I've, even though I've wasted a tempo by playing bishop to a3 and going bishop b2, the problem is that this pawn on c5 is super weak. I can now go knight e4 and take, because again, let's say black just moves the bishop, just to illustrate the point. After knight e4, the pawn is in the way. Like, black cannot jump with the knight to the square to take the pawn, because I force the pawn forward, and he's just going to lose his pawn on c5 next move without getting any, any compensation in return. 
So he goes a5, so I go knight to e4. And again, you guys, this is a, this is a very nuanced idea, the whole idea of bishop a3. Uh, the pawn is defended by the bishop, you guys, but the thing is I'm attacking this pawn with a knight and a rook. I'm attacking with two, and it's only defended by one, so black would, black would end up losing that, that trade of pieces. So a4 is played, so I take on c5. Uh, Lenny a trades, goes h4 here. Now I play knight d7. Again, I'm still up a pawn here. Doesn't mean it's cleanly, cleanly winning, but uh, as you as you notice, the bishops are still very passive. The bishop on f8, all it's doing is sort of guarding the pawn on b4, and the bishop on a8 is not really targeting anything. So both both of these ops are really just not doing a whole lot here. Whereas my knights have great squares on d7 and f4. So knight d7, bishop e7 is played. So I go knight b6 here. Uh, and I think the idea was mainly trying to simplify into an end game. As you'll notice, uh, if I can trade the knight for the bishop, let's just say black moves the king and we trade here. For example, you'll notice that in this end game, these pawns, my pawn is on a light square, his pawn is on a dark square. So his bishop can never touch the pawn on b3, but my bishop can, can always attack his pawn because it's, it's on a dark square. So structurally in the end game, um, if we reach an end game with bishops, it'll be very good for me which is also why if i can trade this knight for this bishop it's good because this is a light square bishop which can target the pawn on the light square b3 so bishop b7 is played so i go rook to d7 lenny plays rook to d6 i trade and now a very nice tactic knight to c8 which effectively wins the game and it wins the game for the following reason first of all the knight is forking the bishop on d6 and the rook on a7 so if you take the knight for example i take your rook you take my knight i take your bishop i have a rook and a bishop for a knight and a bishop the game is uh, uh finito so black can't really take so i take the rook if black moves the rook to like a2 i take the bishop he takes my bishop but then he loses his bishop on b7 and again i have a rook and two knights and he has a rook and a knight so he's, he's way behind so therefore, the only other move that black can play, and, and the most obvious move here, is to play the move bishop takes c8. So after bishop takes c8, I take the knight on c6, and once again, black is, black is under attack. I have a double attack on both the bishops at the same time on d6 and c8. So for example, say black were to take this knight on f4, I do not take back the bishop. I actually take the other bishop. I take on c8 with check first. After king h7, I take the bishop, and once again, I have a rook and a bishop against a rook, so I should win the game. If black tries to move the light square bishop, then I just take his bishop on d6. So the only way to sort of prevent losing material on the spot is to go bishop to c7. But after black goes bishop to c7, I play this move knight to d5, and here Lenny resigned in view of the fact that he will not be able to save his bishops. Again, if he moves the dark square bishop, I just take on c8. Um, if he moves his other bishop to like e6, I can just take with the knight. Um, and if he goes to b7, I can take with the rook. He cannot take my knight because then I'll take his rook. And essentially, Lenny is going to lose one of the bishops and he'll be behind by one piece. And therefore, he resigned here. And this was a, this, or not and, I've said and too many times. Therefore, he resigned, which which really got me in, going in the right direction because I was on plus one. I had won one game. I had, I had five draws and winning that game uh really started started pushing me up the leaderboard so it was, it was a very big big win clock yeah i mean clock time always matters especially in rapid games um for sure but yeah lenny was in time trouble anyway but it, i don't think he would have been able to save it i would say that uh i mean maybe i think probably just after the opening it was just bad i think when he played queen b8 he was just in trouble and it was just i mean players are really really strong like if you make a mistake in the opening you sometimes you just lose a game because of that and I mean, I know that for me, like there are many games that I've lost be because of the opening where I make some mistake and against the top players, you can't, you can't always recover if you make mistakes, which is why at the top level of chess, the opening preparation is so important because, because if, you, if your opponent gets the advantage and you're in trouble, many cases, they'll just win the game and you won't have a chance. So, so that's why people spend so much time uh, studying, studying uh, their openings at the top level. How many games did I lose? I lost a grand total of zero i lost zero games um so so yeah i lost zero games so this was a really really important win and now we'll move on to the second game which i won this was the third and final game of the day um the ninth rapid game and this was a game where i had the white pieces against none other than the former world championship contender fabiano caruana all right so this game started with uh with with, with e4 Fabiano plays e5. I go knight f3, knight c6, bishop b5. I play the Spanish. 
Uh, Fabiano plays a6, bishop a4, knight f6, castles, and now he plays bishop to c5. Now, one thing that's I think I think some of you, some of you guys probably uh, probably heard this on my interview after the game. No, I had two white games on the final day, but but what I would say, and this is kind of the funny thing, is everybody here should be very thankful to Fabiano. Um, because in 2019, I played in this tournament called the Isle of Man. And in the tournament Isle of Man, in the very last round, I had the white pieces against none other than Fabiano Caruana. Now, if I had beaten Fabiano in that game, um, nobody knows what would have happened for sure. But if I had beaten Fabiano in that game, um, I would not have directly qualified into the candidates tournament. But based on my understanding of the situation, it would have been where where either Maxime makes it in when Timor withdraws or I would have made it in because I would have uh because I would I would have fit the criteria so I would have potentially gotten that spot instead of Maxime. And as we know, if that happens and I and I actually get into the candidates there, I probably never become the streamer I am today and probably you guys would not have these great streams to to listen to every single day. So, I have to say I'm very very thankful to Fabiano that he played this line against me yesterday or I guess two, two, uh, three days ago it was, um, and he didn't do it against me in Isle of Man in 2019. And the reason that I can say that with such certainty is because the exact line that Fabiano played in this game um, was something that I had prepared for him before the last round in 2019. So again, I can only express my my, my deepest uh, deepest gratitude and thanks to Fabiano for, for choosing to play this against me here in this event and not in 2019. Uh, just so you guys know, that game that I played against Fabiano, I drew the game um, in, the, in the last round. And of course, I, I did not qualify. All right. Um, so yeah, so so back to the game. So bishop to c5 is played. So I play c3. Fabiano plays b5. I go bishop c2. He plays d5. I play d4. Pawn takes. And here I play pawn takes pawn. It's not really a novelty at this point. This line has been played quite a bit. Um, very recently, there was a game played in the uh, final match of the, Ch of the Chess Bowl Masters on Chess 24 between Wesley So and uh, Laquang Liam Lee, where knight takes e5, knight takes e5, d takes c5 was played um, in a game that Wesley wanted to win. I was doing I was doing commentary of that game, so some of you guys might recognize the position. Um, but uh, but anyway, I didn't I didn't want to follow that. So here I played pawn takes pawn. Fabiano trades on d1. I take with the rook, and now. It's a weird position because, again, both the knights are under attack. My knight on f3 is under attack, and his knight on f6 is under attack. So it's very complicated. Fabiano takes on f3. I take on f6. Fabiano takes. Now, Fabiano here has the tower of power, the triple stack. Um, at the same time, at the same time, uh, Fabiano is actually, he's, he's up a pawn here. So currently, black is temporarily, temporarily up a pawn. Um, but it's it's a very it's very kind of complicated position. Anyway, pawn takes is played. I go bishop to e4 here, basically trying to line up this nice diagonal where the bishop. It's actually a wooden shield. Sorry, this is just a classic wooden shield on e4 because I hit everything. I hit the knight on c6, the rook on a8, the pawn on h7, the pawn on f3, and I also guard the knight on b1. So we, we have the classic wooden shield here with bishop to e4. Uh -huh. Bishop d7 is played by Fabiano. Now here I played knight d2. Now white white can take the pawn with the on f3 with the bishop it's even material but if you take on f3 after black castles black is actually a little bit better because or maybe better yeah black is better because white is lacking in development you have three pieces here the rook the knight and the bishop which are not in the game yet so that's why you really try to press the initiative here and develop as fast as you can which is why i played knight to d2 here so now for example say black castles after knight takes pawn white is just significantly better because again you have this classic wooden shield which is just doing great things in the middle so here, Fabiano takes on g2. I go knight to b3. Again, trying to tempo the uh, tempo the bishop on c5. Fabiano goes bishop b6. And now I play knight to d4 here. And in this position, black has to trade the bishop for the knight because, again, this pin on this diagonal is very problematic. Black cannot move the knight because then I would take the rook. Um, and if black tries, I don't know, castle, I can just take the knight. He takes back. We trade some juicers. And then at the end, I win his bishop. And again, I have a rook and two bishops. And Fabiano would have had a rook and a bishop here. So therefore, Fabiano takes with the bishop. I take back with the pawn. Now you will notice that in this position, um, after castles bishop f4, I am currently down two juicers. Black has uno, dos, tres, cuatro, cinco, seis, siete, uno, dos, uno, dos, tres, cuatro, cinco. So black is up two pawns here. Um, at the same time, however, you'll notice that I, I have the I have the double op combo here. I have the bishops which are targeting. 
in all directions potentially. And additionally, I can also put a rook on the c1 square and put maximum pressure towards the knight on c6 and, and the pawn on c7 here. So in this position, uh, Fabiano plays rook h8. Now this is actually maybe not a huge mistake, but not the best move. And as I, as I alluded to earlier, I had done preparation on this in 2019. So I knew that in this position, the correct move was rook hg8. And sure enough, even the, even the computer with, with relatively low depth, it spots rook g8. Basically, the line that I had looked at um, in 2019 was rook to g8, bishop to g3. I believe it was knight to e7. Again, they're probably now with computers are better lines. But the line that I looked at, I believe was knight e7, rook c1, c6, d5. I think it was rook g4 takes rook c4 takes 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 bishop c2 bishop f3 rook e1 rook to d2 bishop to e4 bishop to g4 bishop to h4 knight to d5 um bishop takes g2 i believe it was knight to f4 bishop takes f6 knight to d3 bishop to c3 and now i think it was was it rook takes f2 was it rook f2? I think it was rook takes f2, or maybe it was rook takes b2. And um, and black is a little bit worse, but he should be able to draw the game. So this was the line that I looked at in um, 2019 for the game against Fabiano. Uh, that being said, I felt very confident, much like with the Lenny game, that this would not be easy to uh, this would not be easy to spot. Very very difficult. I saw all those moves in the opening. Yeah, um, <laughs> I remember looking at this in 2015. Yeah. If only Fabiano played all that way then too. Yeah, well, I mean, it's that's kind of the, the big question is like if Fabiano knew rook g8, he probably would have been fine in the game. But again, when you're on your own and the computer isn't there to just give you give you the, the perfect move, in many cases it's very hard. And I would I would argue that for a human, rook hg8 does not look intuitive or, or normal because it, it's like, well, you're allowing rook c1, there's something bad happening, so you have to do something right away. And rook e8 also makes sense, because if you think about the rooks, where do you want your rook's position as black? Like, what, what what does rook g8 really do? I mean, you have rook g4, but it, you know, this pawn on g2 is not really a pawn that matters that much here, because it's just blockaded by the king. So it's, it's a very unusual move to, to think of, especially in a rapid game. And additionally, when you put the rook on e8, it makes a lot of sense because think about black's rooks. You want to rook on an open file. Your other rook is also targeting on the d file. So it looks like the perfect placement for the two rooks on e8 and d8 here for black. So it's a very logical human move. Of course, as I said, computer says rook g8 and laughs at you and, and doesn't fear any danger. But it's not something that I think in, in, a, in a quick game, especially someone should should be able to find unless they already know the move. So rook e8 is played. So I go bishop takes g2. Fabiano plays knight to e7. Now I go rook to c1 here. Fabiano plays c6. And black is still currently up a pawn. And I, I would say if black can get a blockade, say I just throw in a move like h3, and black can get this blockade, potentially on the light squares, black should never really be in any danger of losing. Um, and so one thing that you really want to do, especially when you have when you have ops, is you really want to try to open up the position, which is why I played d5 here, because the bishop has a lot of scope. You really you really need to open up the diagonals for the bishop. So here I play pawn to d5. Fabiano goes king to b7 here, and now I played rook to c5, another very good move. You do not want to trade on c6 here, because if you trade on c6 and you reach some position like this, this is actually completely fine for black. Black might even be a little bit better. Don't forget that black currently is up a pawn. Even though it's a, du even though it's a double pawn, it's still a pawn. So here I go rook to c5. Fabiano takes. I take back. And now he goes bishop c6. Again, trying to get the same line as, as we just looked at. But there is one big difference, which is with the rook on c5 here, uh, after after we take, if, if he takes on d8 with the rook, my rook can actually start swinging. I have rook f5 to hit the pawn on f6. I also have rook h5 to hit the pawn on h7 as well. And it's much different than if we go back to this previous version, um, where if, if I were to take, you'll notice that in this position, trade, 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 my rook is on c1. So basically I get the same position, but with the rook on c5, it's a much better square. And there are a lot more threats that I can create. So I go rook c5, so takes, takes. Um, and here, yeah, Fabiano plays bishop c6. He does not take the bishop on d5, so if he takes, after rook takes d5, black is in a lot of trouble. If you try to go king c6 here to guard your bishop, I go rook d6 check. If you go king c5, I just take the bishop, I'm, I just have an extra, extra, extra bishop. Um, if you go king c7, I can actually take the bishop because it's a double check. 
or discover check, I should say. The bishop on f4 is attacking the king, and the rook on d1 guards the rook on d7. So black is completely lost. So you can't bring the king up to c6 to, to guard the bishop. You can't move your bishop away because then after takes, 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 you're just down one whole rook. So you can't move your bishop and you can't move your king. So the other logical idea is to go king to c8, but this also fails because after king c8, I can now play. I can now play rook to c5 check, hitting the king. If black blocks, of course, I take the bishop. And when black goes king b7, I go rook c7 check. Bishop guards the rook. King comes up. And again, I just end up winning this bishop on d7 here. So therefore, after rook d5, the only way to save the bishop here is to put your rook on e7. Only way to um, only way to not, not lose material. But after rook e7, I can play the very quiet move bishop to g3. The point behind bishop g3 is that say I were to play a move like a3, black was rook g8 check. I block and then he moves the bishop and there's no longer a rook hanging on the back rank. So when I play bishop g3, black cannot move the rook and you really can't move any rook. You can't move either of your rooks or your bishop here. And eventually white should probably be winning in this position because of this, this very annoying pin on the d file of the two rooks. So Fabiano goes bishop c6, we trade the bishops, I take, and here Fabiano plays a move that uh, I think objectively was his downfall. The computer thinks that it's completely fine. As, as we saw in the Lenier game, um, even though people like to think that, that us humans are very good at the game, in all these games you'll see that there's so many little mistakes that we make when you do the analysis with the computer. So so like when I say it's, objectively 98 is the best move, it is for a computer, but I think for a human it made it, made it almost impossible to defend. So after rook d8 is played, Fabiano takes with the knight. Now, again, the idea of taking with the knight makes a lot of sense because the rook is already on an open file. So if you take with the rook here, you can't really get to the second rank to hit the pawns on a2 and b2 because my bishop covers it. Uh, my bishop covers the d2 square. So if you take with the knight, you still have access with rook e2 to hit, hit the pawns. Additionally, your knight on d8 also guards his pawn. So say I go like rook f5, rook e2, takes, takes, you'll notice that the knight actually guards the juicer. So so I'm basically not able to um, to create big threats on the king side here. So knight takes d8 makes a lot of sense. That being said, um, I think it, it's it's kind of very di it's very difficult to play because after knight takes, I go rook c7, king b6. I play rook to d7 here, and now Fabiano plays b4, and it's very tricky to play because first of all I'm threatening rook d6 to to check the king and also collect the pawn on f6. Secondarily, your knight is kind of stuck here. If you go this way. I can just take this pawn on f7, and now you're going to lose a pawn on f6 or h7. And if you try to go like knight e6, I can, I can throw in the check on your king, and then I take, and again, it's the same problem. You're going to end up losing, losing your pawn. So it's very hard to come up with a plan here. And so here Fabiano plays b4, which is a, apparently a mistake. The computer, of course, just says that black can go king to c6 here. And after rook to d6, king b7, uh, rook takes f6. Nobody cares because you have, you have rook e2, and even after rook d6, just knight e6. And, um, and there's there's nothing to be afraid of, or there's nothing to fear except fear itself. And so so the computer basically proves just like how bad humans are at chess. But of course, for, for, for us humans, uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't feel very logical or, or correct to play king c6. Um, and so Fabiano plays b4 here, which also I think as a human makes a lot of sense. You feel like you can't really move the knight of the rook. King c6 is probably bad. So you want to start trying to push your pawns down. So eventually you can try to go after these pawns and your pawns will be one square closer to queening um, on a1 or b1 here. So b4 makes a lot of sense to a human. So I go king f1, cut off this rookie two idea here. Fabiano goes king b5. And now I played bishop to e3. Again, a very sort of quiet, prophylactic move, playing bishop to e3. And the reason behind playing bishop e3 is that what it does is it takes away this idea of knight e6 with a tempo on the bishop. So like here, I could probably play b3. Computer says it's good. But you're always worried about some move like knight e6 attacking the bishop, and then black can move the rook and try to create counterplay. So I go bishop e3 because here you can't move the rook, obviously, because you lose the knight. And now if you move the knight, I just take the pawn. I don't even have to waste time moving my bishop from f4. So I go bishop e3. Fabiano plays king c6. I go rook to a7. It goes king to d5. Um, and at this point, it's already, I think, kind of close to losing. Maybe not completely lost, but very, very difficult to try and hold. Fabiano goes king d5. And now I go rook a8. Again, rook takes a6 probably is, is, is good. But after knight to c6, it's kind of hard to do anything because uh, black's king is very well centralized. The knight on c6 kind of guards the pawn, stops any real real threats like rook a7 to hit the pawns on the 7th rank. 
And so it's I didn't want to really go for that. So instead I played rook a8, uh, pinning, pinning the knight on d8 once again. He goes rook f8. I go bishop h6. Of course, what Fabiano wants here is he wants me to play like h, not h, sorry, something like bishop b6. But after bishop b6, he can go knight to e6, and his knight is free. He guards the rook, and he breaks the pin on the d8 square. However, of course, I don't oblige. I go bishop h6. Fabiano goes rook e8, and now I go bishop d2. And you'll notice that once again, this pin is, is deadly, because if the rook was on f8, you could go knight e6 here. But with the rook on e8, you can't move the knight because you're going to lose. And also, the only square, if you look at this back rank, where black can put the rook and not not and defend it is f8. If he goes g8, it doesn't do anything. You still can't move the knight. You still have this pin. If the rook's on h8, you can't move the knight. You still have the pin. So the only square where black can break the pin is this f8 square. All the other squares, uh, you're, you're unable to break it. So you just you lose the game. So bishop d2, king c5 is played by Fabiano. I played bishop e3 goes king b5, I play rook b8 check, king c6, and now I end up converting this, uh, or not converting, but I end up end up collecting the material, because at this point, I still have this very nice pin, but I can't really do anything further, because black's king is going to go to d7 to guard the rook, and then he's going to move the knight off of d8. So I go rook takes b4, knight to e6, check, king b5, I take the pawn. Now white is up a pawn, additionally black has a double stack on f7 and f6, so this is really, really bad, and then I also have a... Uh, Two connected pass pawns that I can also just try to run all the way up the board here. So he goes f5. I play rook a5 check, king e4. Now I play king e2, another important move. If black could maybe get like something like this and maybe king f3 or maybe f3, there's potential for some kind of comp some kind of counterplay with checkmate ideas. However, here I go king e2. And the problem for black is I'm threatening to go pawn to f3 with checkmate here. So now Fabiano can't even push the pawn because f3 would be checkmate. The rook covers all the squares where the king can retreat. And so the only move to stop checkmate is either knight d4 or knight f4. So Fabiano goes knight uh, Fabiano goes knight f4. Of course, I trade. And I go king f1. And with two connected pass pawns to roll up the board, this is a pretty standard technical win for white. Fabiano goes rook c8. I check him here. King e5, not king f, I guess he can go king f3, but if he does, I just throw in another little check. He moves the king, and then I go rook to c3, and once again, the pawns start marching down the board, or up the board, I should say. So king e5 is played, I go rook b4, and here Fabiano resigned in view of the fact that even if he goes like rook c1, king e2, rook c2, I can just go king to f3 here, and the idea is very simple. I just want to push this a pawn all the way up the board. Very simple, just a4, a5, a6, a7, a8, and win the game. So, um, so, Fabiano, so Fabiano did resign here after rook to b4. And with this victory in the final wrap game, that gave me a one-point lead heading into the blitz portion of the event. And um, I don't know if there's, I, I don't know if there's any, I, I don't have any games from blitz specifically that I want to like highlight. So, I mean, these are kind of the games I'm going to do the analysis on from this event. But I would say that this win, this, this one against Fabiano, really just uh, really turned, sort of it, it, got, it got the engine going. And, and after that, I, I don't think... The, the result was ever in doubt in terms of whether I would win the event. So it was, uh, it was, it was very, very nice. Um, so yeah. All right, you guys, I hope you enjoyed the, um, <laughs> I hope you enjoyed the analysis of, of these games. These were the two most important games, I think, which led to my victory. And uh, it was just a great event. How does it feel when your opponent plays into your prep? Uh, it feels good. It, feel, it feels good. It does feel good. Um, so well, that's all I can say. It's just a lot. It's a lot of fun when that happens.